was Jesus. Yes, sir. Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I'll get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I am not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. I've always liked this particular account of the resurrection of Jesus. And for many, many reasons, and I'll try and just share some of those reasons with you now. What I love is this is a scene where some very loving, loyal people go to visit the tomb of Jesus. And they're going because in that kind of culture, the belief system of the culture, there was a certain amount of time that you had to look after the death properly for it to enter eternity well. So clearly uh, Mary, in fact, it's Mary Magdalene, is the one who is wanting to ensure out of her love and care for Jesus that he makes it to the other side well. That's why she's going and when she arrives, she's surprised to find that Jesus isn't where she expected him to be. And we have all of this kind of, she runs back and then some of the disciples come back with her. And I often think this is a scene where there's a mixture of grief, confusion, and doubts. There are questions, there are worries, there are concerns. There clearly is grief all over this visitation and panic. Mary seems to be <coughs> the beacon of loyalty in this story. Now, nobody seems to understand the meaning of this. Despite Jesus giving clues and probably going through scripture with his followers, it does show you that when something is taken from you that is precious, grief can often stop you seeing what is right in front of you. Grief, confusion, doubt cloud, clouds the minds of those who go and visit the tomb. Now the men go back and Mary stays a little longer in the garden. A garden of tears, she peers back in the tomb and then two angels meet her and they ask her why is she crying? And she explains why she's so upset. And then she happens to bump into what she thinks is the gardener. who is was really the hidden presence of Christ in her grief. And Jesus asks the same question. Why are you so upset? Given that Jesus 
had in all its hints and tips, and in John's Gospel, that point, had been very clear about his mission. You may have thought that Jesus might have said to Mary, pull yourself together. Haven't you listened to a word that I've said to you? And I love the relationship that we see. God isn't into dictatorship and control. He's into relationship. So he asks Mary, as do the angels first, what is the matter? That's it. First this. Almost as if God woos out our deepest pains before he ever reveals more of himself. It's the wrong way around, isn't it, really? Surely Jesus should have just spectacularly revealed himself and got rid of the tears and all of that, yet there is a walking with Mary in grief. Now what's beautiful about this story is Mary doesn't expect to meet Jesus in a figure that looks that she thinks is the gardener. There's an unexpected meeting with Jesus. And how does she recognise that that gardener is actually Jesus? Well, it's this. It's that Jesus uses her name. That, I think, is wonderful. Jesus just speaks her name. And as soon as that happens, she's able to see that in her garden of tears, there has been Christ with her. Christ has been by her side. This is an unexpected revelation for Mary. And actually, you could say it's an unexpected place to see God hanging around by a tomb. And Jesus says to Mary, I now want to give you a mission. She sees hope is alive again. Jesus is in front of her. She cries out in praise. And then Jesus gives her a message. He says two things to her. He says, don't hold on to me. Don't hold on to me. Go and take the message of resurrection to those who have yet to get past their grief to see the hope that is being birthed. Interesting, isn't it? Don't hold on to me for yourself. Mary, don't hold on to me for yourself. Let me go. And Jesus says, because I have bigger things that you do not understand to do, but go and give the simple news that I am alive to the others. Share me with others. You know, we live in a day and age and uh, where there is great grief, confusion and doubts, look at the way of the world. Some of us, we look at our own lives and are filled with grief, confusion, and doubts. And sometimes we think those things are bad. We think those things shouldn't happen. We shouldn't doubt God. We shouldn't doubt the words of Jesus. But sometimes when it appears that hope isn't present for us, we question and we are confused and we are doubtful. And yet the only reason we do that is because we have a loyalty to want to find Jesus. We don't want to lose Jesus, but sometimes he seems to not be there. We all have our own experiences of places of tears and darkness, just like Mary. But the encouraging thing about this story is in our grief, in our confusion, in our doubt, in our garden of tears, God does not come close to us with a rebuke. He doesn't come close to us with condemnation. 
but draws alongside of us in order to understand us. It's a little bit like when Elijah is depressed in the cave and the Lord comes to Elijah and says, why are you here? God is a God of relationship who comes alongside us. But sometimes Jesus comes alongside us in a very unexpected way. Sometimes we don't realize the presence of Jesus with us. Sometimes we don't expect the gardener to be the carrier of Jesus. Sometimes Jesus appears in very different ways and with different means. And we've only been accustomed, just like the disciples, to having Jesus in one particular way. And suddenly for Mary, Jesus comes in a mysterious and unexpected way. I'm sure if we talk together on our tables, we could recount experiences where Jesus has met us, where we never expected to find him, and through a person or people group, we never expected to have access to him. Because you see, Jesus, his ways are bigger than ours. We might cling on to an image of Jesus for ourselves and an image of the kingdom of God, but Jesus is always bigger than these things. We have to be open, I think, in life to unexpected encounters with Jesus. One great thing about this story is that I think we can expect a good and loving God in Jesus to be with us in our own times of tears in our own graveyards, facing our own tombs of loss. He is with us. But sometimes he reveals himself. And just as Jesus revealed himself to Mary in the most tenderest way by using her name, he often reveals himself to us in the tenderest way possible. He uses our names because he knows us. He doesn't chastise us. He doesn't condemn us. The moment he says our name, we as his sheep hear his voice. And in hearing his voice and realizing that the hope that was once dashed is now alive and in front of us, we are enlivened to share that goodness and that resurrection life with others. But there is, of course, a warning from this story. Mary could have refused to let go of Jesus. Jesus had things to be getting on with that Mary knew nothing about. But she could have said, no, I'm not going to let you go. You are mine and you will only be mine. And Jesus says, that's not the way this works. Hope to be fully realized is to be shared with others. Don't hold Jesus for yourself. Allow Jesus to be available through you and that hope to others. We have to be very, very careful when we actually, we almost, I would say, we nail Jesus down again in our boxes in the church and we keep him just for ourselves. Jesus is for this world. The hope of resurrection is for this world. The message of hope is to be given to this world. And let me just give you a lovely insight here. In John's Gospel, the first evangelist is a Samaritan woman, is an outsider. And the first apostle, technically, because the definition of an apostle in the early church was one who had encountered the risen Christ. So who is the very first apostle? 
It's a woman. Categories of people in that society who were on the other side of history, who were seen as half the value of a man, and Jesus says, Mary, you're the one to go and share this hope. That encourages me that everybody who feels less than somebody else is usually given the tasks by Jesus to spread his goodness to all. In fact, I wonder whether it is only really the people who experience forms of marginalisation that can really see and share the heart of God. Because if you're not marginalised, you're just privileged. And that's when you start nailing Jesus down to use him to keep your privilege. It's those on the margin, the first and the last people called in John's Gospel are unexpected characters. And look at us lot in this room. Would you choose you? Would I choose me? I'm not sure about that. I don't think I would actually. You know, we wouldn't really choose each other. And the world wouldn't do that. You know, we'd, as you would choose anybody off the apprentice, but you know, we're an armor by people who have big things and good things and business people and all of this, that, and the other. And Jesus comes to a rabble like us and he says, Our names, and he says, Go and tell my people, my other people spread in this world, that hope is still alive. And yet he does still warn us. The danger is, once you find, you can keep. And he says, do not keep. Once you have found me, let go of me. Let me be me. <clears throat> and you share your revelation. Today, friends, if you are in grief, confusion, and doubt, no problem. No problem. Because God isn't a God that overwhelms us into thoughts of submission by overpowering us, but rather He comes alongside us. He says, I understand that. I understand why you feel that way. And yet in Christ's compassion and solidarity, once he gets to our name, we realise he has been with us in our own garden of tears. And when we can see that, and when we can appreciate that, we are able to take the hope of resurrection into this world where people are dwelling in tombs, by tombs of despair with lost hope. We are able to be, in a sense, the mysterious presence of Christ to others. Love indeed wins. Jesus is risen from the grave. Good news is not dead. Hope is not taken away from us. But rather, as we encounter Christ and share Him, hope is birth. Resurrection isn't just a one-off event. It's something that we continually so on through our lives into this world. Let us be a people of resurrection. People who draw alongside those in their own despair and grief. And we give them the hope of life by restoring their dignity, seeing them, naming them and then telling them, run along, because there is more to live for than you could have ever have imagined. Amen. Amen. Let's just uh, close our eyes and pray as the band come forward. <coughs> Lord, we thank you for your ways, which are bigger than our ways, more mysterious than our ways, and greater. Forgive us, Lord, when we would have preferred you to have won the whole victory in one go, and used power, coercion.
coercion and control. And yet, Lord, you often gently come alongside us, realizing and recognizing who we are and where we are. And you tenderly say our names, which brings us alive again to hope. Lord, so many people in this world are not seen. And if they are seen, seen, they are not named in the way that you would name them. You restore dignity and value to people. And as we receive your naming of us, we see more clearly the hope to which we are called and that which we are commissioned to share. We thank you for the encouragement that it is those often on the underside of history, on the margins, who are called forth to bring your praise and to speak your praise. Open us up today to that wonderful calling that we, Haywood Baptist Church, are seen, we are named, we are called, and we are commissioned to be the people of the resurrection in this town of Haywood. Bless us 